This next discussion is going to be about surrealism. And again, this is in your later Europe and the America's content area. Okay, talking about the surrealist movement. Um, basically, surrealism is super interesting because it defies all logic and it's extremely embedded in science and experimentation. And so it's kind of easy to understand the art when you understand the motivation behind it. Um, basically dreams um, and the workings of the subconscious mind um, inspire art and they inspire art filled with strange images and bizarre juxtapositions. So you're gonna hear that term a lot for this unit juxtapositions where you're putting two unlikely images or objects, you're, you're putting them together that wouldn't usually go together. Um, so directly this movement was inspired by the advancement of some of the social sciences. And during this time, it was the psychological studies of Freud and Jung. And these two um, psychologists were known for um, believing that a lot of behaviors came from the subconscious mind. And they really um, made quite a few advancements in that arena of studying your um, subconscious and those dreamlike states, analyzing dreams, um, trying to figure out the meaning behind what you're thinking when you're not actively thinking. Um, so it was that mindset that really inspired the surrealists. Um, they really sought to represent an unseen world of dreams. They wanted to execute and almost illustrate subconscious thoughts um, and unspoken communication. This, this was the basis of their subject matters, um, but then also they brought in tons of symbolism um, and choices of form and medium. So in this uh, movement, you're gonna see a few different uh, mediums kind of grow out of this and a few uh, different choices for form. But then you'll also see some traditional things like working with symbolism um, and trying to communicate you know, feelings and emotions. Um, 1924, it started, the movement started with theories of Andre Breton. Um, he's kind of the father of surrealism. And like most of these movements, it actually started again as a literary movement. Literature really paved the path in the 20th century. And then naturally, um, visual art and other art forms followed. Um, but most importantly, you need to understand that the surrealism movement actually had two different paths. One path um, was extremely abstract and they would call it biomorphic. Um, and we're gonna see some examples of that here in a second. The other path was kind of reality-based subject matters. Um, reality that was painted in or sculpted in very unusual ways. Um, so we're gonna look at some examples that's going to help you visually define these two separate paths, but it is important to know that there's two branches kind of of surrealism and two branches of style is what we're talking about. Um, it was also a movement that was extremely influenced by the German philosopher Karl Marx. So again, we're looking at a movement of art where art um, represents society and what is happening in society, uh, how humans are advancing and what they're going through and what they're learning. And then art directly reflects that. Um, surrealism is purposely meant to puzzle the viewer. Um, it's meant to challenge their interpretations and to fascinate them. And I think interpretations is a very important word that when you looked at their art, it, you were not supposed to get a direct message. And it was kind of for the first time open to interpretation and, and that this was purposeful. 
Um, we know that that just kind of happens naturally, depending upon who you are and where you come from. But this was extremely purposeful and considered successful when artists made the viewers ponder and question and interpret things in their own ways. Um, it is just not meant to be clearly understood um, and didactic. It is really meant to be kind of open-ended. Um, and then here in the bottom, I just have some images of our um, psychologists, both Freud and Jung. So we're gonna take a moment here and just talk about Andre Breton, um, since he's so integral and kind of formulating this surrealist movement. Um, but surrealism came from Dadaism. And when we ended the Dada unit, we learned that it really directly transformed into surrealism. So one thing you're gonna notice with these movements that we're talking about in 20th century, um, they're short and they're quick. Um, and so you're gonna see a lot of artists, right, that were part of a couple of movements. They're not isolated. What you are looking at is a growth and a, and a progression through learning and through experimentation. And so you're gonna have artists that span a couple of those different movements that they dabbled in expressionism and they dabbled with Dadaism and then they morphed into you know, art that fit into surrealist art. And that's gonna you know, continue on. So don't be confused if you see artists that have artwork in multiple movements. That's very normal for 20th century. Okay, so back to Andre. Um, so he was a member of the Dada group and he went on to lead the Surrealist movement in about 1924 and specifically in New York. Um, so he's quite responsible for bringing this conceptual art to New York and helping it flourish there. Um, him and his colleagues would create surrealist exhibitions um, that, you know, they were isolated exhibitions for artists kind of dabbling with this movement and um, would start showing the artwork. And, and that's what gets it out there in the public. That's what gets collectors interested. That's what gets people invested in this movement. And that's what makes it grow are these exhibitions. Um, he would introduce a lot of ideas of automatism and intuitive art making. Um, and he kind of helped um, start the abstract expressionist movement, which we will be learning about here shortly. Um, he worked with various creative media, uh, multimedia, focusing him himself focusing mainly on collage and printmaking because really his foundations were in literature. Um, he liked working with poetry um, and kind of the found word. And that kind of morphed obviously into collage and printmaking. Um, but he would definitely innovate ways in which text and image could be combined and kind of working with that Dadaist um, mentality of things happening through chance and, you know, not being, not the artist not being fully in control, that letting your subconscious mind kind of take over decision making. So, for example, think about cutting up a magazine or a newspaper and you're cutting up images and you're cutting up a bunch of words, right? And then you turn them all over so you only see the backs and you don't know, you know, what word or what picture is on the opposite side. And then you, from this pile, you randomly pull 10 words and five images. And then you piece those words and images together to make a piece of artwork. So they believe that a lot of this was left up to chance, but they really felt that there was some sort of um, underlying, um, you know, subconscious dis decision that was happening here. Um, so that's kind of what he was known for and how he 
kind of sparked the surrealist movement. Um, his ideas about accessing the the unconscious, the subconscious, and using symbols for self-expression really served as the foundation to this um, movement. So I told you we're going to look at some examples of the two styles of surrealist art. So we have the abstract biomorphic, that's one style, and then the reality-based subjects, that's the other style. So on the left-hand side here, I have um, the biomorphic, and I have some featured artists here, which would be Jean Arp, uh, Jean Moreau, Francis Bacon, and Salvador Dali. Um, up here, we have uh, Jean Moreau, and this person is known for, you know, abstract shapes. Um, he would paint, but he would also collage and sometimes do a combination of both. Um, right here, we have a sculpture uh, by Jean Arp, and these are, again, kind of abstract shapes that are morphed and put together. Um, and again, what's important about this is totally left up to interpretation by the viewer. So when I view this sculpture, I may get a feeling or a connection, um, you know, to one thing, but the person right after me could come and view this and see something totally different in it. And again, that was something that was celebrated in surrealist art. Um, down here, we have a triptych painting. A triptych just means, you know, three panels by Francis Bacon. And then right here, we have a painting by Salvador Dali. So what you can see happening here is obvious. We are looking at abstract shapes and we are looking at shapes that maybe resemble, resemble biology or human anatomy, but they're so abstracted that you really cannot be sure. Um, opposed to the reality-based surrealist art over here on the right. So um, artists that used this style is Rene Magritte, Salvador Dali again, Max Ernst, and Man Ray. So Salvador Dali, he was kind of involved in surrealism in almost every facet possible. So he's known for his paintings, and his paintings um, encompassed both avenues of surrealist art. So he completely participated in the abstract biomorphic, and then he also did reality-based subjects, both equally as well. He is also known for his photography in his film. That's uh, a lot of people don't know that about him. Um, Salvador Dali, what I think is really important about his artwork and the reason why I'm taking a, a moment to talk about him is because to my surprise, he is not one of our featured artists in our books under surrealism. Um, but to me, he's definitely the most iconic. I think he's the most well-known, but I really think that he exemplifies this movement the best because he dabbled in it so much and he mastered all of the different mediums. Um, but what was totally amazing about his artwork and something I did not realize until I went and visited the Salvador Dali Museum was that his paintings, which are usually oil, um, were absolutely humongous. They were um, easily, you know, eight to 10 feet tall. Um, so imagine this artist creating these dreamlike worlds, these very crazy um, surrealistic worlds that are literally larger than you. And it almost felt like um, a, a world that you could enter, you know, by stepping into the painting. Um, and I thought that that was very impressive, but also really surprising when I viewed his paintings up close. So moving on over here in the corner, we have a painting by Rene Magritte, and 
Rene is well known for his reality-based subjects. So he, he usually paints a lot of um, extremely recognizable human forms, um, but he creates these really odd scenarios um, that are very dreamlike and, um, you know, just unrealistic. Um, but they make, they make the viewer think and, and ponder and um, they're a little bit kind of, I think they're kind of easier to understand. Um, up here, we have um, a painting by Max Ernst, who you probably recognize that name from the Dada movement as well. And then down here, we have a photograph by Man Ray. And this person was well known for photography and film as well. But this, I think, is probably one of the most famous and iconic photographs um, and a really great example of juxtaposition. So again, putting together two things that don't usually go together. Um, so turning this shape of a woman's backside into like a cello. Um, so taking two things, morphing them together to become something new. Very popular in surrealism. Okay, so now that we've defined our two types of surrealist styles, we're gonna get into our images. Um, this is the first one by Wilfred Lam. It's called The Jungle. It is from 1943. It is gouache on paper, which we'll talk about in a second. And then the paper is mounted onto canvas, okay? So dividing it up into your areas here, um, I have put form and content kind of together. So you may need to separate that accordingly. But what we have here is we have human figures. Um, the shapes, the faces are these crescent shapes. The figures are extremely overlapping, very elongated bodies, specifically their legs. Um, the forms are abstracted, and the color palette is very cool, sticking mainly with blues. You have a few warm splashes here and there, but overall the majority of the painting is cool. Um, you have lots of repetition of line and shape, so a lot of vertical lines that you can see in this painting um, with some very um, noticeable shapes, like the round the rounded circles of the buttocks and kind of these long rectangular shapes of the legs. And this repetition over and over of line and shape is definitely creating rhythm. Um, we have a horror vacui composition. It's extremely crowded. There's really not negative space happening very much at all. Okay, the context of this painting. So um, Wilfred was actually Cuban born. He was a Cuban born artist and his career took him to Europe and to the US. Um, but, you know, his heritage and his ethnicity obviously kept him interested in Hispanic and African cultures. So a lot of his subject matters have to do with that. Um, this specific painting addresses the history of slavery in colonial Cuba. So um, that is really what this painting is about. Um, he addresses um, the slavery, and we know this because, first of all, we have the crescent-shaped faces that suggest a lot of stylization from the African mask. Since we have done the African content area, and if you could think back to all of those African masks that we looked at, um, you can see that that's very true. The, you know, the African masks were extremely elongated faces, and um, you know, working with that thin crescent shape makes proper sense. Um, we also know that the jungle, the title of the jungle, um, represents the fields in which the slaves worked. And in Cuba, those fields would be the sugarcane. And so we also have evidence within the painting of sugarcane. You can see some stalks of these sugarcanes kind of 
woven throughout this painting. And that's what this is representing. So you have the slaves overworked um, in the sugar cane and hence the title, The Jungle. The motivation of this artist, um, he claims that his work was intended to communicate um, a psychic state, um, which that may be so, um, but also you can tell that it was very kind of socially and politically motivated as well. Um, his innovation was that he was executing dreamlike or subconscious imagery. All right, let's talk about this medium here. So we haven't talked about gouache before, um, but gouache is watercolor. It is watercolor paint that has been made to be opaque. So typically watercolor paint is very transparent, very see-through. You can see layers of color beneath each other. If you would think of colored glass, and you would lay colored glass on top of each other, how you can kind of see all the layers of color, but at the same time, they kind of mix to make a new color. That's how regular watercolor would work. Well, gouache is using that transparent water paint um, and then all of a sudden opacifying it. And you would opacify it with some sort of a binding agent. Um, gum Arabic is one of those, um, adding a little bit of white also to the gum arabic is another way of opacifying your watercolor paint and what that does is it keeps the very bright vibrancy of watercolor paint but doesn't make it transparent anymore um, and then again he you paint gouache onto paper but then for whatever reason he decided to mount the paper onto a canvas okay uh, the theme would probably be surrealist art. The convention and the tradition would just be um, overlapping figures that are kind of lined up in a row. There is depth and composition because of the uh, mass of overlapping, or you can also put down that they're figure paintings. Um, so in a comparison, the first things I thought of when I look at the jungle uh, was the plaque of the Ergesteins, and f specifically it was just for the verticality of the figures that were kind of like all in a row, and they were all at the same um, floor line. And then I also thought of the Alexander Mosaic, even though the Alexander Mosaic is a lot more dynamic and a lot more um, diagonals, it's known for its overlapping figures. And so those were my two comparisons for that. Okay, our next surrealist image is called Object. There have been many titles for this piece. So I've always known it as the Fur Cup, um, but then another title is called Object in Fur. So either one of those three, we're all talking about the same sculpture here. Um, the artist is Marais Oppenheim. It is literally animal fur covering a traditional porcelain cup saucer and spoon. It is from 1936. Form and content. Um, there's, there's not much to discuss here because we're working with some found objects. So we're going to learn a little bit more about the found object. We were introduced to that by Marcel Duchamp from Dadaism, but now we're going to continue to push the envelope of um, found object here. So we have a traditional porcelain teacup saucer and then metal spoon. Um, it's covered in animal fur. What type of animal fur? I am not sure. Um, I always thought it was kind of like deer, but don't quote me on that. I've never been able to learn what type of fur it was. Um, the items, so this is the composition. The items are arranged in a traditional real life manner. So it's, it looks like it's in use. You have the cup on top of the saucer with the spoon on the side. Um, that makes it look like, like it's something that is in use. They're not all separated or, you know, look like they're put away in a cabinet. Um, 
and that would be the composition. And then we have a juxtaposition of materials. So we have two unlikely materials, porcelain and fur, um, coming together here to create one art piece. All right, the context. Well, Murray, we'll talk about the artist. Um, she was very, very young when she produced this work. She was only age 22, and it brought her uh, very quickly to fame. So much so that even today, this art piece is definitely known as the quintessential um, surrealist art piece like ever. Um, how it got that status, I am not sure, but it's literally like for an entire movement and for all the artists participating in the movement, she's the one that hit the nail on the head type of thing. So this is kind of like the, uh, the poster child for surrealist art. And this brought her quickly to fame. Um, but then at age 22, when you've already made the best piece of artwork you're ever going to make, um, she really, really stifled her creative growth afterward. And she really didn't have much um, success or participation in the art world after this. Um, this is a paradox of placing two unlike objects together. So again, it's a juxtaposition. The application of fur. Now here's what's very interesting is kind of the theoretical explanation of this art piece. And remember what we are dealing with here are subconscious, unconscious, dreamlike thoughts, right? Or even repressed thoughts. Um, so a lot of theories and a lot of art um, kind of analysis of this art piece says that the application of the fur insinuates erotic overtones. So by wrapping genteel objects, genteel meaning objects that are kind of commonly associated, you know, with with femininity. Um, so you have these genteel objects associated with this feminine decorum um, that has now been wrapped in luxurious and sensual fur, uh, making a sexually punning tableware. Um, so whether that was her intent or motivation, I haven't been able to um, find that, but really remember surrealism is not about the intent of the artist. You know, the artist kind of gets this idea that is based off of dreamlike state or, or subconscious uh, reality. And then the art piece is open to interpretation. So that's how it's been interpreted, that it is a very sensuous, um, sexually punning piece. The motivation that I have been able to find from Murray was that this piece was a direct reaction um, that came to her after a conversation with Pablo Picasso. And in their conversation, he had claimed that you can wrap anything in fur and it will look good because Murray was dabbling with this, you know, concept of found objects and juxtaposition and she was known for wrapping a few things in fur and so specifically um, the story goes that when she was having this conversation with Picasso she had taken a bracelet of hers and wrapped it in fur and so he had commented about it and the end comment was you can wrap anything in fur and it will look good and so um, what had happened then is shortly thereafter, there was this, you know, call for a surrealist art show. It was a call for artists. Um, please submit your artwork. And this is the piece that she then made um, to enter into that surrealist art show. So a couple different motivations, like I said, a reaction from a conversation with Picasso, but then also she was motivated um, to make a piece of artwork to participate in this art show. All right, we've already covered materials, um, but what we're going to learn about here, and honestly, this word should be um, highlighted in red because it is a vocabulary word, but found objects. 
that have been brought together to create a new piece that is called assemblage. So this is how we have advanced the found object. Again, the, the fountain by Marcel Duchamp introduced the found object um, initially, you know, taking something in this world that already exists, not really doing any artistic manipulation to it at all, it being strictly conceptual, and then, you know, calling it art. But the surrealist movement, and thanks to Marais, she kind of took a different spin on it. She would take found objects and bring them together. So now you are you are coming back to the artist doing some sort of manipulation um, to these found objects. And then when you do that, when you have objects that you manipulate and bring together, that is called assemblage. So that is also the innovation here. Um, using assemblage and conceptualization in art. Um, themes could be feminist art, sculpture, and surrealist art, and then the convention traditions that we're working with 3D art. Okay, your third and last image organizer for surrealism is a painting called um, The Two Fridas. It is by Frida Kahlo from 1939. It is oil on canvas. It's about 67 by 67 inches. I am going to do my best to keep this short and to the point, but that is difficult for me because you are definitely looking at one of my favorite and most influential artists of all time. So I've always had a really deep connection to Frida Kahlo and if you don't know anything about her, she is definitely worth a, a documentary watch. Um, she is extremely prolific in uh, a, just the feminist movement altogether. Um, she was an artist, she was a painter, she was a political activist. Um, I just think she's a very respectful person in general who went through nothing but turmoil her whole entire life. And so that is important to know when we learn about the context of her painting. So I really tried to sum it all up and I'll do my best to keep it concise. So content, what do we have here? What is our subject matter? Well, we actually have two self portraits of the artist herself and they're holding hands. Um, they are seated and they are turned toward each other. They are connected not only by their hands, but by their hearts and the veins in between them. The sky is very um, ominous and, you know, kind of eerie like. Um, there is bleeding that is happening out of a clamped vein on that white dress. And on the other Frida, the Frida on the right hand side here, um, in her in her hand, which I have some close-ups on the next slide, um, is a locket with a picture of her husband and technically at that time, her ex-husband, um, Diego, and specifically Diego Rivera, who we will be learning about when we study um, Mexican muralist. Okay, the form, um, we have strong brush strokes. It's hard to see here, but you know, they, they are very noticeable. Um, you have very balanced symmetrical composition thanks to the two subject matters placed on the left and the right. Um, you have fierce contrast and movement in the background sky. So you kind of almost have a black sky with these white clouds giving high contrast um, and a lot of movement going on with the shapes of the clouds. Um, the figures are extremely stylized. So what that means is um, they're noticeably you know, human figures, um, but they're, they're not painted realistically. They're not rendered to even look like they're, they're dimensional. Um, and so that means that they're stylized. Um, so the painting is kind of flat, even though there are some subtle values, you can see some values like in the wrinkles of the dress and in the skin tone, it still is primarily very flat painting. Um, and that also has to do with the way she treats her edges. Her edges are very crisp and sometimes she even has outlines um, around the edges. So 
that also aids in it looking extremely kind of flat. Um, the context. Okay, so Frida is very expressive and symbolic in her work, exemplifying her personal struggles and her emotions. Um, that is what her artwork is all about. It is about her. And it is about her emotions, her feelings, and the things that she's gone through. Um, I've always found it very interesting that she was considered um, a surrealist artist because nothing that she painted really had anything to do with the subconscious or some sort of dreamlike um, state. Everything was directly things that happened to her or things that she felt or things that she thought. You know, she also made a lot of political art. Um, so I don't, I personally don't really understand the connection except that it was happening in the same time period and her artwork may have looked very surrealist, but maybe that's, you know, when, when you didn't know about her personal life and you looked at her artwork, it looked almost as if it was some sort of like other world or, or dreamlike state. And that's the only thing I can kind of come up with for an explanation there. Okay, Frida lived a very short but very intense life dealing with so much physical pain. Um, physical pain that started from a, an accident that really should have killed her. Um, but she also had a lot of illnesses as a child. She, she did suffer from polio. Um, but this accident, um, she wound up enduring over 32 surgeries in her life. Um, she also had multiple miscarriages throughout her life, um, even though she really yearned to be a mother. She had a tumultuous relationship with her husband, Diego Rivera. They were um, extremely in love and extremely passionate, but um, it was on again, off again. It was um, heartbreaking. It was uplifting. There was betrayal. There was... Um, commitment. I mean, it, it was just everything. And, and sometimes it was very hard on her. She was a political activist um, for the Communist Party in Mexico. She fought for many feminine liberties and the advocacy for her native Mexico and Mexican people. Continuing in context, um, in this painting here, Frida is sitting next to herself with two types of attire. So the white dress represents Spanish formal wear, and then the dress on the right-hand side represents the Mexican peasant. Um, so she really advocated for um, the native Mexicans, and at a certain point in her life, she even started to dress in very indigenous clothing, um, and that was part of her support of Mexican people. Um, this symbolized the division of the native versus Spaniard status in their home of Mexico. Um, the bond between the two is evident by the union of their hands, but also by the vein that unites them. Um, so where one person is weakened by the exposed heart, the other Frida is strong. And where one Frida still pines for her lost love, um, as again underscored, um, by the vein that feeds into his portrait, then the other clamps down on that um, figurative and literal tie with the hemostat. So this is the hemostat clamping onto that vein that has been bleeding out. Um, and then right here, this is a close-up of the locket with a portrait of Diego. Um, and interestingly enough, Frida herself always rejected being lumped into the surrealist movement. So she herself did not see her as a surrealist artist. Um, so I really do want you to consider that when we talk about surrealism. Um, it's been categorized as such, but I, I do want you to be aware that it is very different. Um, okay, the innovation here is the use of self-portrait in this painting, it's a double self-portrait that is extremely innovative, but really in, I would say, 80% or more of Frida's paintings, um, she always used herself as a self-portrait. 
Um, and then she also used um, specifically biological images that were kind of straightforward and gory. So she was not afraid to um, be honest and she was not afraid to be a little bit gross and gory because it was real. And um, she definitely didn't want to hide anything. She was a very kind of bold and brave woman. Um, the function of this art, honestly, it was therapeutic. I know this because that is how she became a painter, was when she was bedridden from her accident. Um, her parents set her up with some paint and a mirror, and she laid on her back in bed and started painting um, and, and then found herself. So I know it's therapeutic. The function is um, self-expressive and she tells a personal story. Um, one of her famous quotes, which I think is extremely powerful, is she would always say, I am the person that I know best. And I use that quote when I coach my young artists and try to get them to understand that the best subject matter is themselves, whether it be literally through portrait or just through things that interest them or their emotions or their experiences. Um, you will never know anybody better than you know yourself. Um, the convention and the tradition would be self-portraits, um, symbolism, and then the theme is just painting, surrealist art, and symbolism. I've also included some other works by Frida so you could kind of just see some of her varieties. Again, they're all self-portraits. But I guess, you know, especially here when you're looking at the, the hunted deer, um, you could see how it got lumped into that surrealist category. You have a juxtaposition here of a deer with Frida's head. And, um, you know, a lot of her imagery, looking at this background, this kind of dreamlike world, um, it, it is very surrealist feeling. But it really goes against the motivation of surrealism. Again, this is all self-expressive. She's not coming up with subconscious thoughts and painting them. So it, it's important to understand the distinction here. Everything that she paints is literally a story, a feeling, an event, a, a happening, an occurrence that really happened to her. And she's using symbolism to represent it. This painting here um, represents all of the um, surgeries that she had to have done on her back and on her spine, and eventually she had to have her spine fused. She lived years and years of her life in a metal um, body brace, um, so she suffered lots of physical discomfort. Um, this image here is of her First of all, she really questioned um, kind of her her sexuality and not necessarily her gender, but um, she this painting represents kind of her being very angry at Diego. And one thing that one thing that she did in retaliation is she cut off all of her hair because he really loved kind of her hair and like her womanly parts. And so she cut off all her hair and started kind of wearing men's attire. Um, and then this painting down here is actually um, a painting of her within in the hospital during one of her visits to America when she unfortunately suffered from yet another miscarriage. Um, and so everything is, like I said, very, very personal. Okay, so here's the summary of surrealism. If you walk away with anything, you need to walk away with this. The surrealists sought to channel the unconscious as a means to unlock the power of the imagination. So disdaining rational, rationalism um, and literary realism, the powerfully influenced by psychoanalysis. So the surrealists really looked towards um, the advances in psychology at that time and they believe that the rational mind repressed the power of the imagination so that's another term that i want you to stick with for surrealism is imagination um, surrealist artists really believed that they were unlocking their um 
their repressed imagination. Um, their emphasis on the power of personal imagination puts them in the tradition of romanticism, but unlike their forebears, they believed that the revelations could be found on the street and in everyday life. So if you remember, romanticism was very kind of dreamlike, but it was more mystical, um, whereas surrealism, they wanted it to be very dreamlike, but based more off of like everyday uh, life and and you know kind of kind of this reality but like a subconscious reality um, surrealist artists another thing that's important to understand is that they they really practiced their discipline um, and they really spent time trying to literally tap into their subconscious mind um, so they would they would help they would do this by um, strengthen and merging their ideas and, and and their imagination by playing a bunch of different like psychological games, um, which also was happening in psychoanalysis at this time. So things like kind of the um, the Horshack test, you know, where you look at the ink blocks, blots and you're supposed to tell the um, psychologist what you see and then, you know, they psychoanalyze you from that. So things very similar to that. Um, automatic drawing was one of them where, um, and this is an example here of an automatic drawing um, where you would scribble freely without any sort of self-censorship at all. And then when you're done, you allow the images to kind of reveal themselves. Um, we talked about um, Andre Breton and how, you know, he would kind of do these um, subconscious uh, word games to help kind of, you know, create an idea or a concept by chance. Um, and, and there were just tons of them, but I think it's important for you to understand that it was, it was important that it was strengthened and practiced, that tapping into the subconscious was something that was taken very seriously and, and almost like scientifically, um, you know, in, in their opinions. So I hope you enjoyed surrealism. And that kind of wraps up our presentation.